thank you to those who are appearing by Zoom and by representing your organizations. We are excited and notes have been taken and I'm sure we'll commence with some outreach and some discussions on how we can work together. Um, in addition to um, asking our league to uh, renew and um, develop relationships with other community organizations and other community leaders, uh, I wanted to bring you some messaging and some information about some of the things that concern all of us. And I think the foundational thing that brings us all together is voting. I believe the gentleman from the Urban League uh, spoke so well and said that's the foundation of all of our rights as we have our different issues and our different passions that motivate us and, and excite us and we want to work on when it comes right down to it, the allocation of resources and how things are managed usually comes and is controlled by our vote. So I wanted to share, um, we'll try to go through it fairly quickly, a PowerPoint that the State League has developed on Senate Bill 90 and some of the impacts on voting. So I'll just push this button here. Oh, all right. Understanding Florida Senate Bill 90. Um, we talked a little bit about the league. We are nonpartisan. We accept men. What we try to do is educate and advocate. Everybody is welcome. Please join us. We're going to cover changes to vote by mail, changes to some election administration, and changes to some election protection. One of the things that's going to be very impactful is that voters are now going to be required to request their vote by mail ballots for every single election. And in the past, it's been you would ask for it and it would be there for two election cycles. So there's a, we want people to know that they have to every time ask for their vote by mail. It's not going to come automatically anymore. And many people are super busy and they may be accustomed to the old cycle. So we want to make sure that people know request every time. How can you request a vote by mail ballot? You can do it by signed writing, in person, or by phone. But there's some new requirements. You must give your last four of your social or have a state ID. Not everybody has those things. Certainly we know that you have to wait in line. It's time resources, it's financial resources, it's not everybody has their birth certificate to get these things done. The League has a new partner that you'll hear more about. The organization is called Vote Riders. And we'll be publicizing them. They'll be on our League website, lwvfl.org. But this organization is committed to helping people get their foundational birth certificate documents, and they fund that. They'll, they'll get them. They'll bring, mail them to you. They will um, provide a ride to the, the state office to get your ID or your driver's license. And they've been around for the last few years. But given this new requirement, this is critical. Because many of the people that we are concerned about are missing some of these state documents. And a lot of people are very afraid of giving their social because there's been problems. There's been a change to the ballot envelopes. On the envelopes, uh, you now have to, in the past, what you would do is you could ask for um, your vote by mail uh, by marking a box on the back of many of the envelopes. Many of the supervisors of elections are saying because of the change in the law requiring that specific information with your state ID, they're going to remove that box. And a study came out that said most people were getting their vote by mail ballot because of that check. Because it's easy, you're voting, it's on your mind, boom, you put the checkbox, you get it, you get it again, and you don't ever miss. But now we're going to have to actively remember, and we're going to have to actively remember more. There's also going to be a place on your, on the envelope where you have to sign, and now partisan uh, persons can challenge your signature. So there's just these little and big uh, changes that are, the net Im impact could be very negative to voters. There's next big change is with drop boxes. They now require to have a 
live person monitoring the Dropbox at all times when the Dropbox is in use. And there's, there's a limitation on the times that the Dropbox will be available. It's now limited to regular business hours, unless it's the main supervisor of elections office. But for everybody else, it's going to be regular business hours. And that seems like, why are you doing that? The purpose of a Dropbox is for those who are not able to get downtown to the reg during regular business hours. So like myself, many times I work late hours, I just do get my little ballot and put it in a little box and I'm perfectly happy because I get my receipt or my notification, I can go online and check. Well, that has changed. And we we are very concerned that this again will have a huge impact on those with uh, financial limitations who are working several jobs to make ends meet. They're not able to get that time off. They often have uh, jobs that, you know, they have, that might get a 15 minute break. They're not able to, I'm gonna take off two hours to go downtown and they often don't have those kind of jobs. They have the kind of jobs that if they miss, if they miss it more time, they can actually lose their job. Um, it's certainly going to impact those who have disabilities and things of that nature. Um, in Bay County, the day after this law was signed, our supervisor election took down our one drop box. It had been there for over 10 years. I use it all the time. I used to use it all the time, but it's gone because there's a penalty now with the supervisors of elections if they break the law or do anything different, $25,000 fine. So you can understand the impact on our supervisors of elections. There's another thing that's been changed that we're very concerned about. In the past, under the law, if you were not receiving compensation, you were there was no limitation on the number of executed ballots that you could pick up and turn into the supervisor of elections because you're just doing a, a, a courtesy. You're being a good citizen and you're helping others who may not have the schedule to do it or may have a disability. I know many times I've been in church and I will hear a pastor, either my pastor or visiting pastor, I'd be visiting another church, and the pastor would say, okay, remember everybody, bring in your ballots. Uh, Mrs. Smith is gonna take them in for us. And so for the elderly who were often driven to church by another church member, that just, you know, was comfort is someone that they knew and trusted was going to take care of this vital civic civic uh, thing. And now, if it, it's limited, you can only do two. Only two, and except if it's family, and they have the definition of family: brother, sister, husband, wife, that kind of thing. But this is really going to impact a lot of communities that rely upon each other to get those ballots in on time. Um, and of course, we know that many people have had concerns with regards to the mail because there have been changes in our, our mailing process. There have been delays. There have been cutbacks. And so people, they were using the Dropbox a lot, and they were using others to deliver their ballots to just make sure that your trusted friend is going to, hey, I turned it in. You know, you could trust that person. So that, that's been taken away from us. There's also been a big impact on organizations such as the League. We are what you call a third party voter registration organization. And how do you become that? You become a third party voter registrant when you receive, physically receive, an executed uh, voter registration application. The moment you take it in your hand and have possession and control, that makes you a third party voter registrant organization, even an individual. And before you do that, you have to register with the state, fill out information about who you are, your contact information, and you have to know that you have to turn in the, the ballots within a certain amount of time. Well, what do we do in the league? Our league members know every time there's any significant change to the law, we train up our league members and they have to take a quiz and they have to get 100% because we take our voter registration work so seriously, it's foundational. Once we've asked a person to take the time to fill out the form, we're gonna make sure it's done right, and we're gonna make sure it's turned in properly. So one of the things that, um, that we have to do now is that we um, have to uh, 
You now have 14 days to turn in the voter registration application, but you are not allowed to turn it into the wrong county. So a lot of times when we would be at fairs or public functions and a lot of flow of different people near, nearby, we didn't worry too much. You know, we'd have them fill in, oh, you're from the neighboring county. You'd turn it into your SOE, and that person would, he or she would get it to the right place, right? No more. Now you have to know when you take, you look down and you see, am I going next door? Am I going to drive that hour, two hours? If not, then you have to ask the person to take it in and mail it themselves. We are saying that league members, your league can have envelopes and you can have stamps. And if they wish to take the envelope and stamp and put the address on it right there and then tell them to take it to the post office, because again, we don't want to possess it, right? They have to do it, but we can help them. The addresses of where they need to mail it is on the back of the voter registration application. We also are now required to give a warning. And the, one of the warnings that we have to give, um, we have to say something to the effect of, or we actually, what we're doing in the league, we have our, uh, our warning that's on a uh, sheet of paper that's uh, available for our uh, uh, citizens to read. And in the warning, whether it's said verbally or in writing when they read it, it says, we may not turn in your voting registration application on time. And we feel that's a huge blow to the league and many other voter registration organizations, in particular to the league because we are so meticulous about this process. We do turn them in on time. We do understand the rules. We do take the time to teach each and every one of our members this process. And what is supposed to be done is no member is supposed to register anybody on their own. That is something that comes at the direction of your president. And we always ask for two people to be there together in case there's any questions or anybody says, hey, this funny thing happened to me. You have someone who can confirm and say exactly what happened. And then the president says, turn in those voter registration applications to me or at his or her direction, you turn it to the SOE and get the receipt, supervisor of election. So we are very meticulous about this, and it's very painful and not fair that we would have to make that statement, not only to our feelings and our image and how we feel about it, we could end up scaring off a new voter. You know, they're, they're like, okay, well, I don't know if I can trust you. You know, I mean, if you have to say something like that, so that's part of the litigation that we're trying to get corrected. Um, there's been some changes with regards to what they call line warming, when people could offer um, food or drink if it was hot outside. Of course, we're in Florida, and there is a long line, and there's been a history, not just in Florida, but through many southern states, where the longer lines and the less opportunity uh, to have services is often in the black and brown communities where you could have people, you know, waiting for many hours in line. So the, the prohibition is within 150 feet of the, uh, the entrance of uh, the voting uh, precinct. But there are many groups that have expressed they're very concerned about doing anything nearby because they don't want to be accused you know, the per you might give it to them down there, but the person walks up with it and they get closer. Well, how they get that? It has, you know, the league gave it to them. So there's just a lot of fear and concern about it. And it, it, we feel that it, it's an, something that uh, is not helpful. Um, it, there's also a prohibition, as you some of you may know, that there were private funds that were given to supervisors of elections in the past. There were concerns that they were being asked to do a lot of extra work. And this is before Senate Bill 90, and there were funds that uh, supervisors of elections could apply for. And with no strings attached, you know, use them for their work. And now they're saying, not only do we give you more work and you have to pay someone to sit out there and look at the Dropbox 24-7 or whenever it's open, and we're not giving you any more money for that, and you have to make these other changes, and now you have to notify and tell all the citizens you know, with phone calls, postcards, mail outs, all these additional expenses to let people know of the problems, guess what? We're not only not giving you any more money, 
you can't get any more money from anybody else. Again, it's like, how is that helpful to the citizens? Certainly not helpful to the supervisors of elections. There's another provision that when people want to resign to run for another office before there might have been um, an election, and now the governor wants to, has the power to appoint someone in that position. So when the election finally rolls around, they've been an incumbent. So they, they get that benefit. There's a change um, about re for returning citizens. We refer to those people as persons with felony convictions. And now um, there's a public records exemption who, for people who've had their voting rights restored. Um, not sure if that's a hindrance or a help, but that is there. Um, a lot of times we want to know, did people that we help to register to vote who are returning citizens, you want to check back and make sure there's been no problem. So this would inhibit our ability to check. And as many of you may be aware, the League has a vigorous program where we have uh, created some continuing legal education programs for lawyers, and they can learn how to go into court and modify people's records so that they can be able to vote. So we like to make sure that that the process went through. There's also a requirement if there's any civil suits that the supervisor of election must notify the governor and the several of the government, the state agencies before any settlement can be done. What can we do? We can let our representatives know that we are not happy with many of provisions. A gentleman mentioned, you know, you can, as league members, you can uh, look for candidates who are opposing the things that uh, Senate Bill 90 has done. Um, you can join organizations that support voting rights. You can join the league, and I think I heard, I heard someone that's going to do that. And you can help register new uh, voters so long as you become a third-party voter registrant and follow the state's rules and guidelines about that. When people become members of the league, the league covers you for that and you will get training if you want to vote, uh, register voters. Um, should we go on to the next one or take questions right now? We had a, qu a question. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. I have one okay. question. Maybe we should stop here. Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. Are we sure that having the warnings in written form for the registrants to read for themselves is adequate? We have checked that this follows SB 90. Some have been trained that they must read it aloud. Uh, there's no requirement to read anything aloud. It just says give a warning. And as you, for example, many of us go to the doctor with our kids and with ourselves, and they don't read those uh, warnings out to you. They give you a piece of paper, and if you have a chance to read it, good luck. But you sign off that you were notified, and usually says you can have a reaction. We know what it is. But if you like read the fine print, it goes on and on and on and on. I mean, some bad stuff could happen with some of our shots that we get. So it is lawful in the state of Florida to provide warnings in writing. It's done every day. That was the only question. Does anybody in the room have any questions? Oh, okay, go ahead, sir. Yes, ma'am, Stanley Gray. What proactive measures have you all taken or are anticipating uh, to combat this the two person uh, rule and the family rule to turn in um, registration? Well, what we're doing right now is we're litigating. In fact, um, we're in the middle of depositions right now. We are challenging this law and the, many of the provisions that I've pointed out to you as being problems, they are being challenged right now by the League. In fact, the League was the first organization to file the lawsuit within a few hours of the law being signed into effect. Um, Im immediately after we filed ours, several other organizations have filed lawsuits. So looking at different aspects and focusing on different things, the Legal Defense Fund is has filed um, Plaintiffs along with us are uh, Black Voters Matter uh, Fund, and several other plaintiffs have joined in with us after that time. I think, uh, we, uh, and so there's there's many groups that are being represented and bringing out what the problems are. And we're in the middle of the discovery part of the litigation, like show me your documents, let me talk to your witnesses. That's where we are right now, but we're very, uh, we're opposing it very aggressively. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. 
Angela Birdsong, League member. Um, I'm just wondering with these lawsuits, um, are they going to be able to take effect or have an effect before our next election in 2022? We hope so. Certainly the judges are well aware of the time limitations. And in the past, um, this matter is in federal court. In the past, um, the judges have responded very quickly. They've moved their deadlines and they've moved hearings around because they want uh, not only to get to the answer, they want to get to the answer as expeditiously as possible so that we as citizens and we as voting rights organizations can inform the public and the media that helps us get the word out on many of our issues. But they're well aware of the timelines. But if you don't follow all the steps, then the other sides can say, try to invalidate your win. So you, there are certain things we must do, and we're in that process right now. Yes. With regards to, thank you. With regards to the two-person drop-off restriction, is that per day or period? That's for that election cycle. And then how is that tracked? Different groups have proposed different things. This is all brand new, literally was passed a few months ago, but we're not sure how they're going to enforce it. But the, it's interesting that the Attorney General Moody is involved in our litigation. Okay. She has stood into our litigation, and that is a law enforcement entity. So let you think, hmm, they want to know what's going on too, and they are filing their paperwork. Hmm. And also, would you please review the resign to run one more time? I didn't quite catch the yeah, basically, um, instead of letting the people choose who is going to fill that position when someone resigns to run, the governor has taken that responsibility. Basically, what that would do for the person that he or she, that he uh, appoints, he or she, will then be in the role and be the acting incumbent. And then in an open election, I've done the job. I can do it now. And so it's obviously an advantage. Um, so different supervisors of elections are making decisions on that um, for early voting and polling places, but none has been required by Senate Bill 90. Hi, my question is regarding um, the 150 feet away with delivering water and whatever. Uh, do the organizations, is there a certification process or um, ahead of time or uh, are there restrictions on that? How does that work? Well, the prohibition is quite broad, and that's one of the things we're litigating, like what you, just what you said. What exactly does this mean? But what happens when you have statutes that prohibit things that are not really carefully worded, it, it can expand, and nobody knows. What is that definition? So the actual impact is many people won't have anything because of fear of being said that what they did was wrong and being getting in trouble. And, you know, certainly our sorority, which I'm a member, we're a member of the same sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, um, that would not be something that our sorority would do because, you know, we are above board and we follow the law. So you can imagine many other organizations don't want to be pulled into potentially violating the law. So the outcome of not wanting to get close to the line, just don't do it. And, th and then probably maybe that should be the last one so we can go on to the other topic. But this is great that while people were thinking about it. Go ahead, ma'am. So you mentioned about private funding that um, the six super supervisor elections are restricted from obtaining this additional funding. What kind of response have they been given to you about how that's going to impact them because they're having additional expenses but they're not getting additional funding. All of the supervisors of elections testified vociferously against pretty much every part of Senate Bill 90. They came on record. Their association was very clear for all the reasons stated. 
difficulty, no money, not helpful. We had great elections. Why are you doing this? Florida was done before everybody else. Everyone said, this is great. And then you reward us with all these limitations. They have not been fans uh, by their testimony uh, be, as all of this was going on. Okay, we'll get the last question so from the... The last question in the chat um, from Susan Greenbaum is, what is the league doing to promote online registration? Well, we do tell people about online registration, and we have been once it uh, came into place. So we let people know that. Um, many of the persons that we're concerned that may have marginalized situation, they may not have internet at home, they may not have the minutes on their phone. So that is a tool that works for some people better than others. So when we are there in person and we have the paper and we're able to do it, that is off often been our most successful efforts at reaching different communities. I just want to mention, I think we had someone come in a little late, and I didn't know if she wanted to introduce herself. Okay, there, I think I saw several people come in a little bit later. Go ahead, ma'am. No. Welcome. Thank you. So important to have you here. Susan, Susan wait one moment. Okay, wonderful. The sorority is turning up. We <laughs> showing up. Okay, thank you. And there was a gentleman that came in. I'm sorry. Say that again. Oh, fabulous! Thank you, and and welcome. Uh, the newspaper and the media is is our community's friends and help us monitor everything going on in government and through the community. And did you have somebody else, Teresa? Um, the person who asked the online question had wanted to ask. Um, for clarification, did you want to get to the redistricting first? And come yes, to because I'm looking at the time. Okay. Thank you all. We're going to go through the redistricting. I want to tell everybody about that painting. Hibba knows that, the artist. You know the artist, Hibba? Mr. Lewis? No, no, the one who painted Mr. Lewis. Right? Yes. Ricky Steele. He's an African American artist in Bay County where Hibba lived with us for many years. And that's actually um, a replica. It's, a, it's an original painting, but there was a stamp that was put out in the 80s of the little boy who had painted that on his face and put vote. And it just says everything, doesn't it? And so that's, that's been around for a while. And he knew how much I cared about voting, and he painted that. And, and my husband came into the office one day, and because we share office, we're law partners. He says, I see you added to your collection. <laughs> But I, I really thought it, it really it connotes, you know, pretty much everything. So redistricting, what is redistricting? It's a process of drawing electoral districts where we know what citizens in a particular uh, line or a particular uh, designated area can vote for which representatives, basically. And the goal is Citizens should pick their politicians. Politicians should not pick the people that they want to vote for them. Because when they do that, they're artificially increasing their chances of winning. And they're artificially decreasing the, the uh, strength of the voice of the citizens who have been what we call gerrymandered. Now, the electoral districts we're going to do in a few uh, months this is something that comes every 10 years after the census. Because of COVID, the census results were delayed, and as you've heard in the papers, they were the information was put out in August, and usually would come out early in the spring. So there's, in our state, redistricting is done only by our state legislators, and that will be done um, in, during the legislative session. They're talking about it right now, and they've had some, some meetings. Things we want you to take away is that there are a lot of things that can be done that can be harmful to communities uh, when redistricting is done. One of them is, let's say you had a Hispanic community, and in the past, the district allowed most of the people in the Hispanic community to be in one district. What does that mean? Is that means that that Hispanic community, uh, which may be a language minority also community, they have a good opportunity because if it's more than 60% of one group in a particular district, they have what you call a very good opportunity to select a representative to meet their needs, right? So 
what people would do to prevent that from happening, they would draw a line right in the middle. So instead of having the 60%, it would drop to maybe 30%, not enough to fully impact either side or to provide a good opportunity for that uh, minority community to select a representative to meet their needs. Packing is the opposite. Packing is when they say, you know what, we're going to make sure, for example, that there's going to be a black district. So we're going to grab all the black people and, oh, some live over here, some live down here, some over here. So then you get this funny line that looks like a funny misshapen thing to collect everybody. And you're going to be guaranteed. We're going to put 90% in that little district, 90% black. you got a great opportunity to get a black rep. But what happens is all the neighboring communities are then different. There could be all white. And when you have all white districts and the representative has nobody different, then they may not care about the needs of the black people. So you have the one black representative, but you have nobody else speaking to the issues. And as a result of the redistricting that was done in 2010, we'll go into that, my slides will go there, but I'm just jumping ahead. When the litigation was over, the league was involved in the litigation because there was packing and cracking and gerrymandering. All right. Um, we got three new minority districts, two black and one white. And one of them was Val Demings because they, they had packed too many people in one. And when you spread it out, you were able to have more of an impact and a stronger voice. That's an example of real life. Another thing that really changed when you have proper districting, we had a senator, state senator, Flores, was very much pro-gun. After the redistricting, she actually stopped the, the guns from being proliferating in committee. And everyone said, why did you do that? She literally said publicly, my district changed. I now have 30, 40% in my district that don't want me voting this way. And I listen to my people. So democracy is better when we're kind of sharing information and our representatives have to care about more than just one voice. And that's kind of a sophisticated concept, especially for a lot of minorities, because we've been locked out. So when we get our black rep, we're like, great. But if we put too many people in that district that's not needed, we're wasting the extra people. When they could be impacting, like with Senator Flores, she had other people now in her newly drawn district, and she had to listen. And she did. And it was a real impact. Same thing happened with the senator on on uh, minimum wage and another senator on environmental issues. So how the districts are drawn really impact us. And I gave you some examples, but we'll go through the other parts now. And here's an example, it's kind of an uh, image. So basically the idea is you have, if you have two, ro two columns of green and three columns of yellow, if you were to draw the, the districts uh, fairly, the proportionally, you would have two green districts and three yellow. Everybody see that? However you draw the line. If you, but there are ways to draw it so you have no green districts. Look at the one right there at the top left. Because in every of where the, the black lines are, the green is always a minority. They don't have enough to tip. They lose their voice. They're, so they have none. I mean, this stuff is real. <laughs> The green have no voice when they should have had proportionally to their size two representatives. And this is what we're talking about, cracking. You cracked it, all right? Now look at the other one next to it. That one I kind of like because every one of the districts, if you look at the black lines, it's a combination of green and yellow. But sometimes the yellow predominates, sometimes the green predominates. But that, that kind of a lines means that every representative has to care about everybody. They may have a majority of one, that's okay, but they're not gonna be able to turn their backs to the other people, and it just makes for reasonableness in the legislators instead of one group going, I don't even need to deal with y'all. You know, uh, I've got my people over here, I'm gonna be fine, I'm gonna be safe. And even though I may not in my heart agree with that, I'm not responsible. So the, the, how the lines are drawn and how we blend people together, it's a balance. We don't necessarily want packing 
and but we certainly don't want voices to be erased. So then you look at the other one, it's straight line, it's two and three, two green, three yellow, with uh, lines drawn straight up and down in a way that is good because it's proportional, but those reps are gonna speak to their base. How are they gonna really care about the other people? You know, they're gonna say my base, my whole group is, so these are the things we need to think about and we need to watch when the maps are being proposed, we need to look for those kind of problems. What is the outcome of the proposed lines? And so that's some of the things we're asking our league members and all citizens to do. Pay attention, turn up. There's gonna be a lot of stuff on the Sunshine Channel and Florida Sunshine Channel so we can watch, we can ask. I went ahead and I kind of talked about this just a little bit. In 2010, the citizens of Florida passed fair districts. And we're one of the few states that literally says it passed by over 63%. We do not allow political gerrymandering. Now we, have, we also don't allow uh, racial gerrymandering, but we have the, voting, the Federal Voting Rights Act that says no racial gerrymandering, but there is no law in federal that says no political gerrymandering. But in the state of Florida, we got it. And that case came from the League of Women Voters and Common Cause, we sued and we won, and it was a big deal. And I told you some of the benefits of what happened when the maps were redrawn. We got those benefits, I, I mentioned them to you. So um, what are the basic concepts of fair districts? One, we talked about um, you cannot benefit one party over the other with the district lines. You cannot harm racial or language minority groups their opportunity to participate equally in the political process as a language and elect a representative of their choice cannot be diminished by the way you draw the lines. The lines must be contiguous. So you can't have a little blob over here and a little blob over there. It's got to be all connected up. If you can, then those other things are desired. We want the districts to be as compact as possible. In other words, not some long skinny thing over here and then you come, we want it, <laughs> the shape to be as close to a circle as we can. So that's called being uh, compact. We wanna follow geographical elements if we can. We wanna follow um, the jurisdictional, like the county line, city line. Be aware of those lines when we cross them. And we want the populations to be as equal as we can in population in the districts. So that's our Florida Fair District rules. The Supreme Court recently has made some rulings that uh, directly impact on redistricting. One is Shelby v. Holder, and that is um, that actually impacted Senate Bill 90. Many Southern states had a long and sordid history of repression and laws against black people voting. Just straight up is on the paper, we saw it, we know it's on all the video, it's acknowledged. And so the, the, we had laws for, through the Voting Rights Act that said these certain states, before you could pass a law to impact voting in any way, shape, or form, it must, must go through pre-clearance of the Department of Justice, and they would look to see if there would be a disparate impact on racial minorities or language minorities. Shelby Case said, I believe 2013, said that we don't need to do that anymore. Immediately after that case, the Shelby case, Supreme Court made that ruling. Many states across the nation, especially in the South, started with these voter ID, voter this, you know, we're gonna check that. Many of the same things that we saw with Senate Bill 90 is a result of Shelby. Rucho v. Common Cause, that was where the Supreme Court said there is no federal statute or standard against political gerrymandering, but, they cited our Florida fair districts with approval in the federal United States Supreme Court. They said, hey states, you wanna fix this problem? Do what Florida did. And they cited the League of Women Voters case by name. And they said, Florida did it, it's clear, it's succinct, you can do it too. So don't come to us to do the work you haven't done. So it was kind of a bad case in a way, but they did throw some positive light on what we have done with our fair districts. So we intend to hold our legislators to, the Supreme Court said it was clear. It said it was the thing to do. So we need to make sure, what can we do? 
We're having a community discussion right now to educate people. Um, we certainly know that we can go to the courts if we need to. We want you to contact your legislators. A lot is going to be online through the Florida Channel. Um, we talked about joining the League and other voting rights groups. We are nonpartisan. We just want the fair district's um, provisions to be upheld. And something we can think about down the road, not immediately, but maybe we should think about legislation to change um, having our districts drawn by politicians. Maybe it should be an independent commission, which is recommended by many voting rights think tanks. Or like, you know, let's take it away from the pressure of politicizing it. So um, I wanted to throw some of the names of the legislators who are in charge. Uh, Senator Ray Rodriguez is the chairperson of the Senate, and those are some of the other persons who are in charge. And you can find that information by um, going to the Senate or the representative uh, website, and also the, um, the uh, Florida Channel. Um, Basically, what's gone on in the state of Florida, we have had some population shifts. And when you have population shifts, that's another uh, thing that can impact redistricting. We gained one more congressional seat. So that we're going to have to figure out who's going to vote for that person, right? And where's it going to be? Um, there's some federal law that's out there that's been stymied. There's For the People Act, and there's also the John Lewis Act that um, has uh, passed uh, the House but not passed the Senate. Um, let's keep in mind local. Again, people mentioned how local things are important. And right about now, um, lo some local school boards and counties are doing redistricting. And that does impact you locally. And we want to remind people to look on your county website and you can get involved. We've had some league members get on the commissions and certainly track that because that's of utmost importance and that's, that hits us where we live. Those are some of the sources that we used. Um, the, we often look to the Brennan Center. They have a lot of good articles and they're a fabulous voting rights group and uh, good old Wikipedia is often has them. There's Ballotpedia and there's different places that you can go. We are updating our league website and we'll have a lot of information there for you also. Thank you and we'll be open for questions. Can I, can I just say we had, um, we had our first confusion with the, with the online versus in-person at the end there for a second. So I'm gonna stop share on that presentation and then um, just let you know that um, the people through Zoom could not hear um, Deb Kaufman when she said new people had entered and that you were asking them to introduce themselves. So at the same time as you were doing that, there was somebody online who was speaking with the follow-up to the question that was answered before and felt cut off. So I just wanted, we, want, we were gonna try to see if we could use the microphone, if you could hear somebody with a follow-up question through here. And if not, um, I'll try to read from the The only chat. reason why we didn't do the follow-up yes. because we wanted to get to the other presentation. I know. And I think if they could have heard what was happening in the room, there wouldn't have been any confusion. Okay. So do you want to hear the follow-up question to that? or well, I think the fairest thing to do okay. is move on to the next okay. topic because we had uh, probably okay. over 20 questions. Okay. So when you compare, we want to make sure. Okay. But the, the follow-up question or comment can be presented to, to yeah. Deb and we can respond. Okay, so now at least I understand what happened there. There was some, I couldn't tell I, what was happening here. I understand, but what, what we're trying to do is, is give balance to both topics. Is there any, okay, go ahead. How does the state law also uh, affect, does it, yeah, the fair districts law at the state level refer to county redistricting as well? No, it does not. But county redistricting and that they do look at the Voting Rights Act standards and they would possibly be subject to problems if they didn't adhere to those. And some of those guidelines, our fair districts were extrapolated from the, fair, uh, from the voting rights standards. And then we'll do in the room and then Teresa, let us know if there's anybody waiting in chat. Go ahead, sir. Ma'am, I think the answer to my question is, is fairly obvious. 
But I don't understand why we haven't introduced, even if it's through litigation, uh, the use of technology for redistricting. I mean, because you can control the parameters and let it spew out as opposed to having our representatives or other people do this. I don't understand why this isn't like, you know, an initiative. Well, other than the obvious. Okay. Um, I, I think I understand at least part of your question. I would say that having spoken to map, mappers who do this kind of work, some aspects of it are straightforward, but there's always balancing act because there, with our fair districts, we have about six elements. And so there's, there's two things that are mandatory and everything else is, well, we have a river here, so we may have to impact the county but there's a river. So you still have a human being balancing that. Uh, well, we don't want to impact this minority district. If we put, if we equalize the population, we're going to put more white people in there and that's going to lower their ability to have a representative of their choosing, their opportunity. So there's always that human element if to answer you, why don't we just turn it over to a machine? That, that is why. But who is the people that we turn it over is another question and is something that we should be looking at. Well, we're at the very beginning of it right now. So um, we are just, you know, going through normal procedure, which is the, a person who feels aggrieved or, or an organization such as the League of Women Voters of Florida, you file a complaint alleging these are the things you're doing that are harmful to me. And the League often speaks on behalf of citizens because we're an organization. We have individual members and we speak on behalf of the citizens. So we would make those allegations, and where we are right now is the other side, which is the state. They have a right to ask us, what exactly do you mean by that? Do you have any evidence to support? And so that's where we are right now. They're getting the evidence from us, and we're getting evidence from them. And then when the lawyers look at all the evidence, they will decide what other motions they want to file, if I've answered that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, there was a person in the room. Oh, oh right. right. Um, Pat Hall, I just wanted to um, say to Stanley, I don't know if you went to any of the meetings with the county. Uh, the last one, I believe, is tonight. And I asked, what kind of software did they use to get the demographic information ahead of the supposed release September 30th? And they said the software was ESRI, E-S-R-I. And that gave them the information they needed to make the proposed maps for the county commission sites. And Ms. Miller has a map that um, was printed out and proposed. Um, so she might want to say something more about what she did. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Myers, I'm sorry. And thank you. Yes, uh, as Commissioner Myers representing District 3, I did um, propose a map that keeps District 3 when African American person can serve uh, in the district. We did lose a few people in population, but keeping the district pretty much the same uh, for District 3, and that is important. Uh, as the young lady said here, we do have our final meeting tonight, but you can also go online at 2021 redistricting to our web page and make comments up until tomorrow night to 11.59. So redistricting is very important. Uh, it didn't change that much here in Hillsborough County, but the way we did, and as I've said to the Board of County Commissioners, it is a single member district issue. Uh, and we have to keep that in mind because those of us who are elected and voted we are representing our constituents uh, that elected us to that seat. So I just want to share that with us. It is important that you look at the map. My map is map F. 
okay, and it's 38.5% in population for African Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there's a question over here. Let me know when there's anything in the chat. I know the state process has just started. Yes. But what is your kind of early assessment in terms of how transparent and accessible the process is going to be for the public? It doesn't seem like they're really out there yet um, helping the public. Okay. Uh, first of all, when an entity violated the law as openly and as clearly as they did, and the court in 2010 literally said that they made a mockery of the Fair District's law, and they actually admitted we intentionally misled the people. They actually, it's a piece of paper in court that they signed, the Senate president signed that in the litigation before. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's known, that's not an opinion. All right, so given that happened, and they had promised transparency before, they're promising transparency now, of course there's concern because there was misbehavior in the past. At the same time, we want to encourage good behavior and one of the ways that we do it is by letting them know we're watching and letting them know we haven't forgotten what happened before and that's why we bring it to people's attention so that you can say to your representative, what can you do to show me and reassure me that the same thing is not gonna happen again? Interestingly, at the uh, Senate meeting uh, this, this week, I, I was present at the very first uh, Senate committee meeting, uh, Chair Rodriguez specifically commented on the misbehavior that had occurred in 2012. And he said, in 2010, he said, we don't want to go there again. We want to be open and transparent. And I had to give him some credit for acknowledging it publicly. Y'all had messed up. You know, that was bad. And he literally said, I don't want to go there again. Well, I got up on behalf of the league and behalf of an, a coalition that we're a part of called Fair Districts Coalition, and they helped us with the litigation in 2010. And I said, sir, thank you very much. We have asked, the coalition has asked every single representative, of every single senator to sign something called a Fair Districts Pledge. And about 18 of them have signed it. And he says, well, is it exactly verbatim the same thing that's in fair districts? I said, not exactly word for word, but extremely close. And he in indicated that because it was a little different, he felt he couldn't sign it. But what we're trying to do is get them to publicly say, we understand fair districts. We're going to abide by it. And he did make some of those comments then. So we're going to watch and we're going to verify. <laughs> so we, we had that bad experience and we know what can happen. And we know the benefits of having fair districts. I discussed some of them with you already. Anything else? Well, I, I see we're really close on time. and We've done pretty well. I don't want to, to overgo, but thank you so much for this opportunity, Deborah. You, put together a wonderful program and I'll let you make your closing remarks. Thank you so much. I'll just start with one thing in the chat, um, that they have the option of holding meetings at the local, uh, I should say who said this? 